start by answering the question of my host. You see, why is it that a foreigner has to come in and make this analysis when apparently no Indian has made it so far? Uh, there are a few books about the intrigue of the assassination, but there is none about the motives behind the assassination. And so as a foreigner, I found something to contribute here because so far in India, there has been a big taboo on this subject, a taboo observed by both sides. You see on the Congress side, they continue to glorify the Mahatma and to, um, to harvest electorally from that identification with Gandhi. And on the Hindu side, precisely because of the assassination, they feel very inhibited to talk about it because any criticism of Gandhi uh, would remind everyone of their supposed association with that assassination. So um, in fact, all sides in India had come to an agreement to uh, forego discussion of this, uh, the reasons behind this assassination. So um, like an innocent child, I sort of walked in and, and addressed that topic because I was not encumbered by these taboos that exist in India under the present power equation. Mahatma Gandhi was born in a Gujarati Banya caste, a trader, and that uh, perhaps makes it very fitting that his picture is on all the rupee notes in the upper Banya. And indeed, during his life and during his political career, the left uh, criticized him, uh, saying that his um, any reforms that he advocated invariably benefited the trader community. Some, some measures were anti the common people, you know, who often collaborated with the British because it was easier or it uh, was against the Brahmins. It was against any community except his own. That's what the communists, for example, said. Anyway, uh, he was from a good family. His father was the prime minister of a small princely state, uh, which means that, you know, he was, uh, he had a fairly comfortable upbringing. However, uh, his parents belonged to a strict Vaishnava sect. Uh, in Gujarat, several Vaishnava as well as Jain sects were very strict about nonviolence. So his own reputation for the value of ahimsa of nonviolence is not is not his original doing. You see that he was spoon fed practically. Uh, he married very early, and um, he had four sons. Then uh, he had an English education. He was sent to Britain for higher education to become a lawyer. Then, when he had become a lawyer, he took service with an Indian Muslim trader in South Africa. He is uh, known for a certain sexual prudishness uh, in his own life that was aggravated by his guilt feeling uh, over having had intercourse exactly at the time when his father breathed his last. And soon thereafter, he um, imposed on his wife um, decision for sexual abstinence for the rest of his life. Uh, as for his further private life, famously, he refused his wife modern medicine when she was ill. That could have saved her life, but she died. Uh, meanwhile, he was a very um, dictatorial father, very traditional old school father. And for instance, he refused modern education to his sons. So he himself had had modern education with the uh, social benefits accruing to it. He blocked his son's marriage for five years. It was an intercaste marriage with the daughter of a fellow freedom fighter, Rajaji. 
uh, Radha Gopalachari, who was a Brahmin. So it would have been an inter-caste marriage. And I wonder if that was not the um, secret reason, reason that the Mahatma had for opposing the marriage. He, of course, also opposed it because it was non-traditional. It was not an arranged marriage. It was a love marriage. But so, as it happens with love marriages, they are not so careful about caste boundaries. So it also was an inter-caste marriage. And while opposing caste discrimination, the Mahatma famously did not oppose the caste system itself. He was a very traditional Hindu, in a way. In his last years, he shared his bed with young girls in order to test his chastity. That's what the um, explanation was that he gave. Now, he was a man of more than 70 years old. I don't know how you have to test your chastity at that point. You see, for years he had lived with his wife in complete chastity at a far more vigorous age. So I think that that is more than enough as a test of chastity. And so the few fellow Congress leaders who knew about this didn't like it, but usually didn't dare to openly oppose it. The only one who openly criticized it was Sardar Patel. And um, as someone has written a book about it, uh, uh, Radha Rajan, and so she suggests that the uh, Mahatma Gandhi's opposition to Patel in becoming Congress leader and ultimately the first Prime Minister of India had to do with his vengefulness about Patel's criticism of this strange practice. Anyway, you see, for saintliness, it is very bizarre. Uh, so many people throughout history have practiced chastity, either as monks. I mean, there are stories like about Catholic priests who go astray sexually. But by and large, numerous people wedded to celibacy have maintained their vows. Many millions of certainly women, but even men, have taken their vows seriously, have remained true to their spouse, have not gone astray, have not practiced a lack of chastity. And yet you see this supposed saint at like 75 years of age had to test his chastity in this way. Okay, that's uh, bizarre. But you know, he was a very bizarre, eccentric man. Uh, he wrote a sort of autobiography when he was still quite young. His story of my experiments with truth in 1909, which is a decent book in terms of criticism of Western civilization and colonialism. You see, to that extent, this is quite uh, worthwhile. It's mainly located in South Africa where he was making his career at the time. And so there he gained experience as a leader of nonviolent agitations. In the famous movie about his life by Attenborough, um, much is made of the little successes that he gained. Now the thing is that at that time, the British did throw him little successes because they could afford to because the stakes were so very low. Like one thing you can see in the movie is an agitation against a newly passed law in South Africa that uh, recognized only Christian marriages. And so, so Gandhi pontificates, you know, to this Hindu audience that, you know, all your marriages now stand and hold all your wives are whores and so on. And that agitation was successful. The British took back that law. Now, of course, they could afford to take back that law. You see, that was, that was um, started by an overzealous Christian among 
the British uh, rulers and withdrawing it was of no consequence. They didn't lose any power because of this. And so, you see, from a distance, from in India, when you heard about this, you could easily wax enthusiastic about Gandhiji's successes, but they didn't amount to much. Resting political power over a subcontinent like India from them, uh, which to them was an enormous economic asset that they didn't want to give up easily. That would be far harder. And indeed, that he never succeeded in doing. You see, Gandhi's major claim to fame is that with his non-violent agitation, he wrested sovereignty over India from the British. And that is still upheld as Congress propaganda, but um, that cannot stand historical scrutiny. Anyway, um, in that uh, autobiography, he criticizes British culture. And there is a saying by Gandhi that is often quoted. He was asked about the civilization of the West. And he answered, yeah, that would be a good idea. Let's go civilize the West. And so <laughs> that's an interesting and, and valid way of seeing it. It was a stand pro Swadeshi, pro uh, native culture and native production and so on. Um, but not too consequential. And especially one that obscures his own actual real life loyalty to the British. In three wars, he actively worked for the British either actively serving, um, at least in the uh, ambulance service, not, not uh, bearing arms himself, or he recruited soldiers uh, for the British in the Boer War, in the Zulu War, and in World War I. In World War II, when uh, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar agreed to recruit soldiers uh, for the British war effort, he was lambasted as a recruiting officer. I've never heard anyone lambasting Gandhi as a recruiting officer, when in fact that's precisely what he was during World War I. He was also, I will not say pro-Islam, but certainly anti-anti-Islam. He did not want to know criticism of his life. And so that had partly something to do with his personal situation with him working for a Muslim employer. <clears throat> In 1916, he returned from South Africa. As far as I've been able to ascertain, it was not Tagore, but uh, Swami Shraddhananda who first gave him the title of Mahatma, uh, namely when he temporarily enrolled his children in Shradhananda's school. In 1920, he succeeded Bal Gangadhara Tilak, who had been a very principled uh, leader of the freedom struggle and who believed in total independence, who thought it was the birthright of India to be independent. So he succeeded him as Congress president, which in fact from a viewpoint of in independence was a step backwards. You see, he still believed in dominion status within the British Empire, a status comparable to that of Canada or Australia, or indeed South Africa. He doesn't remain president of the Congress. And in fact, after a while, he even ceases to be a member of Congress. But de facto, he had dictatorial powers within Congress. Now we come to a really difficult point. Um, during his tenure as Congress president, he had to deal with a very serious crisis, which he took to be a great opportunity. 
Namely, there was a major Hindu Muslim conflict. This was a side effect of the Khilafat agitation. You see, this had to do with the um, caliphate, which until then was hand held by the Ottoman rulers in Turkey. So after World War I, Turkey had lost badly and the position of the caliph was in question. And so by 1924, the Turks themselves would definitively end it. But in India, there was quite an agitation because now the British had usurped some of the powers of the caliph, namely the sovereignty over the holy places of Islam. They were in Arabia and they used to be under the sovereignty of the Ottoman Caliph. Now the British and the Arabs together had taken it over. And so the Indian Muslims were made to believe that this was a serious attack on the Caliphate, on Muslim sovereignty. So a um, Caliphate movement uh, started. Now, until then, and in fact, even after, Congress was mainly a Hindu movement, also with some notable Parsis, but mainly a Hindu movement. There were active attempts by Congress leaders to attract Muslims. They even bribed Muslims to come and fill up the ranks during Congress conferences. When Gandhi was a president, he tried to curry favor with the Muslims by extending his support to the caliphate cause. So he derailed the nationalist freedom movement to support a communal and international cause, that of pan-Islamic uh, caliphate movement. And um, it's not only Gandhi, of course, many other uh, Hindu leaders supported the Khilafat movement at the time sincerely believing that by supporting the Khilafat movement, they would then be thanked uh, by Islamic support for the freedom movement. This was a way to attract Muslims to the freedom movement. Now, this actually never happened. What did happen was that the um, two things happened. One was the, the, the real Khilafatists who took a seriously Islamic view of the situation. They decided that Indians living under the Brits who had turned against the Caliphate and therefore against Islam were now in a situation where they should either leave the country, do a hijra like Mohammed did when he left Mecca for Medina. And so that was a fatwa given by Maulana Azad, who was one of the leaders of the movement, the later education minister. Maulana Azad told Indian Muslims to leave India. And so thousands sold everything, migrated to Afghanistan, so that there was nothing there for them and in desperation had to come back. Um, but meanwhile, the alternative to Hijra was Jihad. Muslims could also take up arms against this infidel power and remove it from power. That's what happened in Kerala, where the Moplas, the Kerala Muslims, declared war against the British. Now, it is one thing to declare war against the major power. Uh, there's a, a very similar case in uh, the Second World War, 1941-42. The British ruled Burma, which was being attacked by the Japanese. So they gave weapons to the local Muslims, whom we now know as the Rohingyas. Right? Now to attack a formidable powerhouse like the Japanese army for these amateurs 
who had been given a gun, but not much more, uh, was a bit hard to do. So what they did with the guns that the British had given them was to attack their non-Muslim neighbors. So the Buddhists and Hindus in Burma were attacked by the Rohingyas. That is the start of the Rohingya problem that all the uh, international media try to conceal from you. Anyway, so something similar happened with the Moplas. They declared war on the British, but they actually attacked the Hindus around them. So thousands of them were killed, raped, or forcibly converted. Then when the British moved in, they had little, little difficulty in uh, putting down the rebellion. Uh, meanwhile, some of the Gandhian activists had become a bit less than non-violent, had killed a few British policemen. And so Gandhi, for this reason, called off the agitation, which then angered the Muslims because they had counted on Congress support for their movement. And so it became completely counterproductive. First, he had thought of winning the hearts of the Muslims. Now the exact opposite happened. So the, uh, the Caliphate movement and the Congress cooperation with it was a complete disaster. It was completely counterproductive. Soon after, something else happened in India. Um, you may have heard of the Arya Samaj Hindu reform movement that, among other things, tried to reconvert Muslims to Hinduism. And as part of that effort, they criticized Islam. And so a number of their critics of Islam, the first one was Pandit Lala Lekram in 1897, were murdered by Muslims. In 1926, Swami Shraddhananda, whom I already mentioned as welcoming Gandhi's children to his school, had been active in this reconversion. And in particular, he had um, converted a Muslim woman and her children and her husband without for revenge. And effectively, Sami Shradhananda got murdered. Um, he was a very important figure in the Hindu movement uh, for another reason. He's one of the founders of the Hindu Mahasabha, an organization that we will meet again later in this talk. Um, he had also written a book that is better than anything written by Savarkar or, or Golvalkar, which far better sums up the Hindu demands and the reasons why Hindus started a political movement, namely the book Savior of the Dying Race, Hindu Sangatan, Savior of the Dying Race. So he believed in Shuddhi, the purification of Muslims, that is to say the reconversion of Muslims to Hinduism, and in Hindu self-organization self-organization of which a few years later, the RSS became a practical application. Now this Swami Shradhananda was murdered and the British saw that you see now this was, a, this was more than a local affair. This, this assassination was something important and it signified an increasing polarization between Muslims and Hindus. So they reacted against it by enacting the law 295A. You may have heard of this because this law is regularly used in India uh, to prohibit books and to prosecute people who have supposedly insulted another religion. Initially this law was passed in order to protect Islam, to prevent criticism of Islam. Later, much later, First Christians and then also Hindus found out that they too could use this uh, law. It's a very interesting law. Let me say one more thing about it because it's a very colonialist law. 
the British justified it with a very colonial argument. You see, in Britain, polemic between different religions was perfectly normal. The Anglicans against the Catholics and uh, the, the Puritans against the Anglicans and so on. This was perfectly normal. But the British said, okay, we are grown-ups. We are adults. We can conduct uh, debate peacefully and in a civilized manner. Whereas these Hindus are barbarians, are savages. And so if you give them the freedom to practice criticism of religion, then misery is going to follow, assassination and so on. So we should prohibit it. So it's a colonial law for excellence. It's a very good reason to uh, finish that law forever. Anyway, Gandhi's comment is interesting. His comment on this assassination. Namely, he criticized Swami Shradhananda. And he sympathized, he explicitly pronounced his sympathy for the murderer. So that's a very bizarre way of uh, promoting nonviolence, in my opinion. Okay, so the Hindu Mahasabha. In 1905, the British declared the partition of Bengal, the oldest province of British India. Uh, which would mainly give a separate status to East Bengal, which is a Muslim majority area. So there was a communal coloring from the beginning. The movement against this partition, from which we know Sri Aurobindo, for example, was mainly the Hindu movement. And so as a counterweight against the increasing Hindu mobilization, the British mobilized the Muslims and patronized their founding of the All India Muslim League in 1906. Now, in turn, against this Muslim League, Hindus also saw a need to mobilize and to found an organization. And this initially was at the provincial level in Punjab with the first Hindu Sabha. And this was followed in several other provinces. Um, a typical um, participation in this was by Arya Samajis. So the reformist Arya Samaj movement also sought to have a political embodiment, which was the Hindu Mahasabha. Um, this movement had several false starts, like in 1915, the different provincial Hindu Sabhas came together to found the Hindu Mahasabha, uh, which didn't come to anything. But it is the Mopla rebellion that triggered Hindus into getting really serious. And then they, they refounded the Hindu Mahasabha initially as a, as a lobby group inside Congress. So it's just part of the freedom movement. You see, some people say that uh, Hindu political movements uh, are in fact a form of collaboration with the British that they were at cross purposes with the freedom movement. That's not the case at all. It was very much part of the freedom movement. However, in 1935, the Hindu Mahasabha was banished from Congress. And so the members had to choose whether to stay with the Hindu Mahasabha as a separate political party or to return to Congress. For example, the man on the photograph is Rajendra Prasad. He chose Congress, which for his personal career was a good choice. Very soon after he became party president of Congress and later he became the first president of uh, independent India. So the Hindu Mahasabha became an independent political party with as goal the Hindu Rashtra. Hindu Rashtra also became the name of a newspaper um, piloted by a Hindu Mahasabha member, namely Naturam Godse. 
we will return to his case. Soon after, the Rastriya Swayam Sevak Sangha was founded by Dr. Kesav Baliram Hedgevar. <clears throat> he um, had for a while been part of the Bengal revolutionaries. And this explains a number of strange things about the RSS. You see, they have a very uh, negative attitude towards communication. In the revolutionary movement, it was a habit never to write anything down because any slip of paper could be found by the British security service. So they communicated only orally. And so from this, you get the funny situation that RSS people are always on the move. You see any RSS office bearer, until recently at least, took it as a uh, point of pride as a status symbol to always be on the move. And um, so this was part of the system of oral communication that was inherited from the Bengal revolutionaries. Okay, so he started the Rastriya Swayam Sevak Sangha initially as a security service in a 1925 conference of the Congress. You see, after the Mopla rebellion, Congress had become a dangerous enterprise with principally Muslim critics that might become violent. Um, and so then the RSS stayed on and became an organization in its own right. It was intended to be apolitical. So if you wanted to do politics, you could join Congress or later the Hindu Mahasabha. Um, and there you could practice the virtues that you had learned in the RSS. But the RSS itself focused on forming people. That's at least what they say. I had Gerard died in 1940, was succeeded by um, Madhav Sadasi Kolwalka. Um, in the RSS, one of the members of the RSS was Naturam Gotse. Well, who was a young um, Hindu activist. Quite intelligent, he became a leader of Baudhik Pramukh, that is to say, an intellectual leader. He made himself useful for the Hindu movement. For example, he led an agitation of Hindus against the Nizam's oppression of Hindus in, the, um, in Hyderabad. However, he was not satisfied with the apolitical nature of RSS work. He wanted to join politics, namely the Hindu Mahasabha, and he did, which doesn't really mean he quit the RSS. It's not that he turned against the RSS. And indeed, later on, when he went to the gallows, he used to sing, or he would sing the uh, RSS patriotic song for the motherland. So it's important to see, you know, there's a whole discussion whether the RSS is responsible for this or not. Uh, I'd say that it, and also the Hindu Mahasabha was of course not responsible. If they thought about themselves, they would know that this uh, assassination was going to backfire. Um, but you could say at least, you know, it's a fact that one of their members had committed the assassination. Uh, so that's formally not true. Naturam Gotse was no longer a member of the RSS. Uh, but in fact, there was no ideological break between him and the RSS. That's not true either. The great leader of the Hindu Mahasabha at the time was Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, uh, who made a great impression on Gotse. Um, so in 37 to 43, he was the party president. Uh, he was already quite a well-known name in India. After finishing his law studies in London, he was an accomplice to a political murder. Uh, this was in 1910. 
And so then he was transported to India, briefly escaped, but on French territory, he was apprehended and again taken prisoner. So he spent 10 years in the uh, jail in on the Penal Colony on the Andaman Islands, then some more years on the mainland. It is in prison that he wrote his book, Hindutva. And so that's a very foundational text for the Hindu political movement. In it, he defines what is Hindutva. This is literally Hinduness. So Hinduness or being a Hindu is for him a question of um, considering India as both your fatherland and your holy land. So fatherland is not enough. If an Indian Muslim says, yes, but I was born in India and my parents and my grandparents, they were all born in India. That's not good enough. You are only a Hindu if it is also your holy land. If your sacred places are in India and not in Arabia. He was released from prison on condition of abjuring the revolution, which he did. Some communist critics have said that, you see, he was a toady of the British, a collaborator of the British and so on. Well, I think it makes great sense uh, of making the concession that he did because otherwise he would have simply been in jail and missed all the action. So in order to make himself useful for the freedom movement, it was very useful to make that little concession. Anyway, abjuring revolution is the correct thing to do. You see, abjuring, uh, I mean, revolution is a, uh, is a juvenile illusion. And so it's, it's good that he had grown up and abjured revolution. Then when World War II broke out, he thought it was strategically better to side with the British, because then all the Hindu youth who would join the British war effort would get a military training. And after the war was over, there would be millions of Hindus capable of opposing the essentially very small British military presence in India. And you see, even without firing a shot, the British would simply see that their game was up that India was now ready to, uh, to take over. So that as a consequence, uh, there would be seven so-called cons conspirators in the uh, Mahatma Gandhi murder case. Of the seven, three had served in the British Indian Army. Meanwhile, in the 1940s, the talk of the town was the partition of India. In the 1930s, this idea churned in some Muslim circles and it was patronized by Sir Mohammed Iqbal, who had been some kind of a nationalist, who had indeed written a song, Sare Jahan Se Acha, or Hindustan Hamari. Um, that was a serious candidate for being adopted as the national song even after independence when partition had become an accomplished fact. Um, so he turned towards Pakistan, towards the alternative of uh, separation of the Muslim areas from India. And by 1940, this had become official policy with the Muslim League adopting the Pakistan revolution. Um, it's interesting that this was uh, piloted by the Muslim League President Muhammad Ali Jinnah in the Khilafat movement 20 years earlier. He had been an opponent of the Khilafat movement and even more of the Congress involvement with the Khilafat movement. He was a moderate and a very much a modernist. He was British by culture. He drank wine and he wore British suits and so on. Um, but it is Mahatma Gandhi who humiliated him on the stage of a Congress conference. So Jinnah at that time had withdrawn from politics. 
And when he came back to politics in the mid thirties, he had learned his lesson. And then he be, had become a Muslim communalist, which was much better for his career. There were Muslims who were opposed to the idea of partition. This is the Orthodox Deobant school led by Maulana Azad, whom we already saw as one of the leaders of the Khilafat movement. Now, because he opposed partition, he sided with Congress, with Jawaharlal Nehru, with Mahatma Gandhi. Therefore, he is known as a nationalist Muslim. In fact, he was not a nationalist at all. He didn't care for India. He cared for the pan-Islamic uh, movement, but so therefore, because of his pan-Islamic sympathies, he was against Muslim separatism. He thought Muslims should have the ambition to rule all of India, rather than only a part of it. So the problem of Muslim separatism, uh, the secularists nowadays, and Gandhi in his day, uh, would seek uh, local reasons for this or would seek British machinations behind this. In fact, that's still a very, very popular thing to say in India that it is the British who partitioned India, that they imposed partition on the poor, hapless Muslims who never really wanted this. This is total nonsense. It is the Indian Muslims themselves who started the partition movement, who also voted for the partition in, in 45, 46, the Muslim League stood for elections on a one-point program of partitioning India. And so with that, they had 85% of the Muslim votes. <coughs> so this idea of Muslim separatism starts with Muhammad himself, when he fails to have success for his preaching in Mecca, he migrates to Medina where he gets a chance to acquire political power. And then he uses Medina as a base to conquer the rest of Arabia. So this uh, separatism is a temporary strategic measure. The end goal remains the Islamization of the whole territory. And so to create Pakistan was only to have secure ground from which to conquer the rest of India. So the two schools among the Muslims, led by Jinnah and by Azad respectively, had ultimately the same goal, but different strategies. Modernist Muslims were familiar with modern notions like democracy and the nation state. And they thought of the fact that as a minority, albeit a very big minority of 24%, as a minority, the Muslims could not hope to rule India if it would be a democracy. So, according to them, it was better to provisionally settle for a part of India where the Muslims would be the majority. Whereas the traditional Muslims wanted the immediate Islamization of India. After all, in the Middle Ages, the Muslims ruled India without a democratic mandate. They were even far less than 24%, yet they ruled India. So Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a westernized lawyer who opposed or had opposed the Khilafat movement. He thought nothing good would come of it. Mayhem and mass killing would come of it, which exactly is what happened. Yet you see he was humiliated by Mahatma Gandhi, uh, mainly because he you see, the immediate occasion for this humiliation was that he addressed Gandhi as Mr. Gandhi and not as Mahatma. And so Gandhi's supporters in the audience demanded that he say Mahatma. And when he refused to, he was hounded off the stage. So he withdrew from politics. And when he came back, it was as the leader of the Muslim community, not as a freedom fighter but as a Muslim separatist. So he rejected the idea of a multicultural society or a secular society, as they call it in India. And instead he wanted to be the majority in a separate uh, 
Muslim rule country. And he won over the Muslim masses. Initially, they were not on his side. It was mainly by deploying violence that he did so. Uh, yeah, people will best know the um, direct action day in Calcutta, where thousands of Hindus were killed. The Muslim state leader, Shahid Suhrawardi, did not send in the police as long as the Muslims were on the attack. It's only when Hindus started regrouping and fighting back that suddenly he sent in the police to stop the violence. Um, now, this was a very important moment because it sent the message that the refusal of partition would cause violence, which make the Muslims erupt in violence against the Hindus. It is this that uh, convinced one leader after another to walk over to the option of partition. Many Congress leaders like Raja Ji, for instance, like Morarji Desai, and ultimately in June 1947, even Mahatma Gandhi accepted partition, even though Mahatma Gandhi had said, partition over my dead body. Um, also, the British, for this reason, started accepting partition. Contrary to a very, very, very common belief in India that it is the British who had engineered partition, the British actually opposed partition. And so Viceroy Lord Linlithgow told Jinnah to his face that he would never countenance partition. Then the last but one Viceroy, Lord Wavell, he um, also opposed partition, but nevertheless also taunted Congress that they were not really representing India because many Indians, namely those of the, of the Congress, uh, of the Muslim League, um, wanted to split India and were rather in favor of the British as long as the alternative was being ruled by the Hindus. But you see, the full acceptance of partition only came with the arrival of the last viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, in March 47. So by that time, most Congress leaders had already changed sides and decided not to oppose partition anymore. Later historians have speculated what would have happened if people had known about Muhammad Ali Jinnah's medical condition. He was terminally ill. So if they had held out with opposing partition for a few months longer, maybe Jinnah would have disappeared from the scene and maybe the Muslim League would not have been as strong and united, at least strong enough to impose partition on the unwilling rest of the Indians. But Personally, I think that that is idle speculation. Uh, he represented a will that by that time had sufficiently crystallized to persist even without his own physical presence. So if he fell away from the scene, someone else would have taken the leadership and still uh, insisted on partition. Right, now we have Maulana um, Abul Kalam Azad. He uh, was officially a nationalist Muslim, that is to say a Congress side Muslim. But you see, already during Khilafat, we knew that he didn't care anything at all about Indian independence. Um, he was a Congress president during the Second World War, uh, at the end of the war, and he arranged with Mahatma Gandhi, no less, to avert partition. Both of them wanted to avoid partition, though they had a different agenda. So he wanted to avert partition by making the Muslim League the government of India, of the whole of India, by making Jinnah the prime minister. 
So this would mean that a minority of 24% was given the government, you know, in spite of all the democratic rules. And Gandhi agreed to this proposal. It is only the Congress leaders, the other Congress leaders, who of course rejected it. Nehru, perhaps because of his own personal career planning, he wanted to become the prime minister. He did not want to share this job with Sinha. After independence, Nehru made him the education minister. So for more than 10 years, he was in a position to mold the minds of the next generations. He started the movement of negationism, of history denial, of denying all the, um, all the atrocities by Muslim invaders on Hindus. Well, um, yes, this is also about the British hand behind partition. So that's a very common rumor. Uh, let me repeat once more that is simply not correct. Uh, the British had indeed created the Muslim League, but at that time in 1906, it was not at all a movement for partition. It was not at all a movement uh, uh, intended to make a part of an independent India into a separate Muslim state. There was simply no idea of independence for India on the cards yet. So it was a collaborationist movement with which the British sought to serve their interests while the Muslims wanted to serve Muslim interests. But so they were, they had something in common, namely they were against the Hindus and their freedom movement. Mm. It has to be said though, if you want to insist on British guilt, that the British were not guilty at all of partition. But once partition started, there is quite a few, uh, quite a bit of blame you can lay at the feet of the British. For instance, by keeping their army in India, which was still quite substantial, by keeping it deployed, they could have greatly limited the um, amount of violence that would accompany the partition. They could have kept it in far more uh, calmer channels. They could have brought over the, the refugees from West Pakistan to, to India and so on with much less uh, misery and violence, which they refused to do. Hindus have collaborated with partition. Like the British, the Hindus also opposed partition, but nevertheless, once the idea was there, and became more and more formidable. Many of them settled for it, for partition, for accepting partition as the lesser evil. Like uh, Dr. Ambedkar in 1940 itself already welcomed the partition plan because his analysis of Islam was that we can't live together. You know, we have to separate. He even worked out a peaceful plan for exchange of population which um, Gandhi was later to reject. A Hindu leader, Syam Prasad Mukherjee, actually went to Gandhi with this plan of exchange of population. Gandhi refused. He said quite, quite mendaciously, oh, but this is a territorial separatism. It has nothing to do with religion. Now, at that time, the boundaries of this Pakistan had not even been fixed. How could it be territorial? For some cities, it was not known yet whether they would go to India or Pakistan. Like Lahore could have gone to India. It had a Hindu majority. Kolkata could have gone to East Pakistan. Um, so it was nothing territorial. It was purely religious. It was, it was started on the basis of religion and the Muslim League was quite explicit about it. And so this was on the part of Gandhi, this was not a mistake. This was not an honest untruth that, you know, he didn't know better. This was just purely a lie for someone who always swore by satyagraha, by holding fast unto truth. This, is a, this was a serious lapse. Anyway, 
Initially, Congress opposed partition. Gandhi also opposed partition, just like the Hindu Mahasabha did. Gandhi assured the Hindus they should not be afraid, they should stay in Lahore, in Multan, uh, everywhere in Pakistan, uh, because he was going to make sure that there would be no partition. Partition only over my dead body. But you see, in 46, 47, one Congress leader after another accepted partition as a lesser evil, as something inevitable, as a way to avoid great communal bloodshed. And so in June 47, Gandhi too accepted partition and justified. So he abandoned the minorities in all the territories earmarked to become part of Pakistan. They had counted on him. You don't even need to read my book about the um, Gandhi murder. If you start with a very common, a very popular book like Freedom at Midnight by Collins and Lapierre. If you read there what Gandhi said to the refugees from West Pakistan who arrived in Delhi, you know, you... I don't know what to say about Gandhi, but you see only a very seriously deranged person could say those things. He advised the refugees to go back to Pakistan. You see, it is better to get killed over there rather than fleeing your native place. What nonsense is this? You see, if you flee to save your life, then at least you have a second chance Maybe you can try to undo the situation or you can make something else of your life. Um, but you see, to go get killed for nothing is a very bizarre advice to give. If women were targeted for rape, he advised them to cooperate. I ain't come on. You see, when I read passages like this of what Mahatma Gandhi actually said to these refugees, I'm sorry. You see, I, I have a hard time to, to even remain balanced. Of course, that's what I will do. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this element of uh, Gandhian foolishness, Gandhian buffoonery, Gandhian irresponsibility also has to be highlighted. And it it poses a very real question to those who remain loyal to Gandhi. You see, they say, well, Ahimsa, non-violence is a very good idea still, even if Gandhi himself didn't always remain loyal to it. But you see, non-violence in South Africa was a way for the weak to assert themselves against the strong. They would make use of their weakness. You see, they could speak to the conscience of the oppressors by being weak. The, the oppressors would not go into military mode. We have to defeat them because they're equally strong as we are. It's either us killing them or them killing us. No, because they were weak, you see, the oppressor could say, well, um, they have something to say. They can't do us anything. But they speak to us and, you know, it's important what they say. We have to listen to them. That's what nonviolence was originally meant to do. It was a weapon of the weak against us. But now nonviolence became something completely different. It simply meant giving in to the oppressor. Not making your own point, not defending the weak. No, throwing the weak under the bus. This is making them victims of the oppressor. And this was a pretty sick development. So he perverted nonviolence from a strategy of the weak to a suicidal way of high moral posturing. So then we come to our actual topic. All the rest here was just introduction. On the 30th of January, 1948, Natur Godse shoots 
uh, down. Actually, it was the second attempt. The week before, there had already been an attempt, but that had failed. Um, when the time had come to strike, you see some of the conspirators had developed cold feet and the whole plan fell into disarray. One of the conspirators was arrested, the Gambar Badje, and he told the police everything. So at that time, the other conspirators knew that the police was on their heels. So they had to act fast. Godse made the analysis that there were too many people involved. You see all the um, weak links in the chain. So it was better to act alone. And uh, the other conspirators were arrested, including Savarkar. <clears throat> Dear Savarkar, who was not part of the conspiracy, but he was thought to be the sort of ideological patron, ideological guide. So there was a trial. Um, there was a trial where uh, Savarkar was released with no evidence against him. Two others were also released. Um, the others were sentenced to prison, except for Go um, Natoram Godse himself and his friend Narayan Apte. They were sentenced to death and they were duly hanged in Ambala jail on the Saraswati River, which so happens in Haryana. <laughs> Meanwhile, outside the um, law system, what had also happened was a great revenge operation against Naturam Gotse's community, which was the Chitpawan Brahmins. So just like in 1984, the secularist uh, Congress activists held a massacre among the Sikhs, very similarly, because one, one Sikh had killed Indira Gandhi. In 1948 also, um, the uh, Gandhian activists, as well as the caste rivals of the Chitpan Brahmins, namely the Marathas in Maharashtra, uh, massacred hundreds of Brahmins. There is a website um, about Hindu genocide where it is said that 8,000 uh, Brahmins were killed. I cannot. Uh, I don't know about that number, and I don't know where it comes from. You see, it's very dangerous uh, to accept rumors like that. It could be true. It's certainly hundreds. It may be thousands. Uh, you see, there are no, no, no serious research into this. There have been newspaper reports at the time, and on the basis of that, this uh, Maureen Patterson has given numbers, but they're very provisional. They really need verification, and as time passes, verifying this becomes ever more difficult. <clears throat> but so certainly hundreds were killed, including the brother of uh, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, who had also been a great freedom fighter. And so as a reward for his long time struggle and deprivations and sacrifices, he was uh, thoroughly wounded and then died later from his wounds. So, um, consequences of the murders. Yes, there had been a plan originally among the conspirators that one of them would have himself circumcised and that he would dress up as a Muslim and then pull the trigger, commit the actual murder so that the police would find that a Muslim had done it. So that there would be anger against the Muslim community all over India. And this way, hopefully finish the business, the dirty business of partition. Now that was not to be, that was found not to be practical. They didn't do that. Um, but so the, um, 
the communal nature of the assassin would become very important and the, the state radio also understood. So they immediately emphasized that a Hindu had been the culprit. Um, so then there was violence against uh, the Brahmin community, against the offices of the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS. Um, but more consequentially, consequential in politics still today was the police crackdown on the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS. You see, ever since the RSS has remained very fearful of being held guilty, being the object of repression uh, because of an assassination. When Sitaram Goel published in Organizer in the newspaper of the RSS, articles critical of Nehru, that series of articles was stopped with as justification, if anything happens to Nehru, we are again going to be blamed, just as we have been blamed for the murder of the, of the Mahatma. Now, it so happens, you see, if you, if you try to imagine the situation of an organization like the RSS or even the Hindu Mahasabha, even if some individuals might sympathize with a man who had dared to murder the Mahatma, still obviously an organization could not associate with it. I mean, they knew very well what the repression would follow, namely the repression that did follow. This was easily foreseeable. So it is not true that the RSS or the Hindu Mahasabha was responsible for the murder. They, 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 the murder was an individual's brainchild, and so it did not extend beyond a few conspirators. It is somewhat understandable that they thought of this. Um, I interviewed in, I think, 1996, at the very end of his life, um, Madan Lal Pahwa, who was one of the conspirators. And he had a shop in Mumbai at the time, and he had come from uh, Pakistan. They had fled, his, he and his family, 22 people in total. And uh, the family decided to take the train to India, except his old aunt. She, maybe she was, uh, you know, not confident about this modern technology or so she didn't want to take the train and so to accompany her on foot this young fellow Madan Lal Pawa had to accompany her. So 20 people of the family went by train those two went on foot. Now the 20 in the train were all murdered in the train itself. Right? So Madan Lal Pawa came to India and he had lost everything not just material possessions, but his whole family had gone, right? So those were the stories that the Hindu refugees arrived in India with. And it is humanly normal that they hated the Mahatma for it, on the assumption that the Mahatma was partly responsible for the catastrophe that partition had become. So it was the Hindu movement that was the um, main sufferer, the main victim of the murder, except for Gandhi himself. Uh, the Hindu Mahasabha was off the cards. It was abandoned by its party president, Syam Prasad Mukherjee, who was soon to found another party, the Jan Sang, which is the earlier incarnation of the BJP. It retained the presence in parliament only in Gorakhpur, and even there, um, ultimately, I think it was the guru of the present chief minister, Yogi Adityanath, namely Mahant Avaidyanath, who was the last member of parliament for the Hindu Mahasabha. Um, so Siam Prasad Mukherjee, nevertheless, was an important person. He was a minister 
in the national cabinet led by Jawaharlal Nehru before the elections of 1952. Um, and as you know, he campaigned for the full integration of Kashmir with India, for which he died in a Kashmiri prison in uh, 1953. The RSS was disempowered. All the RSS offices were closed. The leaders were imprisoned, uh, including the leader of the organization, Kolwalkar, uh, even though he had condemned the murder, but that didn't help. Um, all the publications from before 1948 were uh, taken over by the government, were probably burned. Uh, this includes a booklet from 1939, We Our Nationhood Defined, which was published four times, the last time in 47. Now, the whole stock of this book disappeared in 1948. And it was never reprinted again. Kolwakar himself said it was a bit immature. It's interesting to know because most, most publications on the RSS still claim that this book is, in fact, the blueprint of RSS BJP policies ever since. Reality is that since 1948, no one has read this book anymore. It's not in physical existence anymore. Well, I have a copy, but... Um, all right, but so, far more important than this law and order uh, measure against the BGP, which only lasted for a year or so, is the psychological effect it had, not the BGP, the RSS. Okay, the psychological effect it had, that's in fact when the mental disease of BJP secularism started. That's when the RSS itself was compromised in its ideology. It started gradually to take more and more and more and more distance from its originally pro-Hindu ideology. So the RSS after this kept on growing. Goldwalker was very good in founding new organizations a Hindu trade union, a Hindu student organization, a Hindu organization for tribal welfare, and so on and so on. So the organization kept growing, growing, growing numerically, but ideologically it was weakening. It was losing its backbone. Precisely because of this, well, guilt that had been hammered into them uh, because of the government's reaction against them after the Mahatma Gandhi murder. Before being hanged, Gotse was given the chance to defend himself. And so he gave a long speech in court. Uh, the text of this speech was published by his brother Gopal Gotse in the mid sixties. And so I've used that text, but I've commented upon it. And in fact, I've been criticized by a number of Hindus on Twitter and so on for daring to add anything to this, to this icon, to this speech by God say that it's only there to be worshipped, not to be read. Now I've critically read it and compared it with the facts of the situation. And so some of it is entirely correct, some of it not so. Um, so many of the criticisms that Godse gave in that speech were in fact quite common, were nothing original. All the politicians who had had to deal with Gandhi were often desperate. You know, you can't work with this man. They thought he was a fanatic, he was an eccentric, uh, he was not a mature politician. Like, for instance, um, he would take the third class compartment in his train uh, journeys, but perceptive Congress leaders beside him said that, well, it takes a lot of money to allow Gandhi to live in poverty. And so, you see, he had donors in the industrialist community 
that allowed him this lifestyle. Gandhi was not a secularist, contrary to what the secularists today say. He obviously and all the time mixed religion and politics, and very explicitly so. He did not believe in a politics divorced of religion. Another thing that could be held against him is that he was an extremist uh, in ahimsa, in nonviolence. He had no power of discrimination. Sometimes a little violence is helpful to prevent far larger violence. Like, for instance, curbing the partition movement in time would have prevented far more violence. Like, you see, if after the direct action day, the British had intervened and had decided to ignore the Muslim League's policies and the Muslim League's violence, and keeping their united, there would have been less bloodshed than now took place during the partition. So rulers, even peaceful rulers, rulers who were for non-violence, who were for limiting the amount of violence, have understood since the beginning of time that sometimes a little violence is needed to prevent far worse violence. Now, there was no place for this in, in Gandhi's scheme of things. He was politically whimsical. You see, he uh, pursued goals and then he dropped them. Um, there was a campaign for complete independence in about 1930, uh, you know, on the basis of a Congress revolution for Purna Swaraj for complete independence. And so he led this campaign and then suddenly he dissolved the campaign without results. I guess for a few very, very minor concessions for the British that had nothing to do with complete independence. And so this meant that he abandoned thousands of activists who had given up their jobs or their studies because of this agitation of which they wanted to be part. Then finally, a critique from the communists, uh, in this case a correct critique, is that he was very much a representative of the business class. You know, they called him the cleverest bourgeois scoundrel. Uh, so that's not that's not why he was murdered or something. That's not the main critique. But nevertheless, that is also a critique that is perfectly understandable. <clears throat> then um, what was not said at the time, but later the consciousness of uh, scholars has evolved. And so they were putting the spotlight on his policy regarding caste. And so he was quite confused about caste. He was all for it, but he was against caste discrimination. He was also an autocrat, a tyrant within his family. And he was not at all a feminist. So by today's standards, he would be very doubtful as a role model. He was not an anti-racist. He was not against the inequality of black and white. He wanted to upgrade the Indians from the status of blacks to the status of whites. But the inequality of white and black, that he accepted. <clears throat> Politically, the worst thing about Gandhi is that he made Nehru his ear. You see, Congress at the time wanted to choose Sardar Patel as the first prime minister. And it is Gandhi who imposed Nehru knowing fully well that Nehru would not continue Gandhi's policies. Like Gandhi had made a fetish out of non-industrialization, about keeping India primitive. Now Nehru was all for modernization and maybe correctly so, about that I don't speak, maybe correctly so, but at any rate, it was not Gandhi. And so Gandhi made him 
the Prime Minister, knowing fully well that he would not pursue Gandhian policies. Um, I've also heard the remark that he could not be accepted as a holy man because he talked too much about himself. You see, a real holy man in India, at some point he takes an initiation in his spiritual path and he dies. He performs his own death rituals and he doesn't speak anymore about his past life. And so for many holy men in Indian history, you don't know the place and the time of birth, for example. You don't know anything about their previous life. Now, Gandhi was poles apart with this. He always spoke about himself. Every morning he would talk about his ablutions and, you know, all his physical business. And, you know, he was absolutely uh, obsessed with himself. Um, then it's, it has uh, happened 17 different times that he started a fast unto death in order to wrest concessions. A fasting unto death to get a concession is an old Hindu practice. Brahmins did it. You see, there was a sin uh, in the Dharma Shastras called Brahma Hatya. If you were responsible for the death of the Brahmin, that was a serious sin. So a Brahmin would say, you see, I want you to concede this or that. I'm going to fast unto death. And if you don't concede it, that means I'm going to die. And you are responsible for my death. Right? So Gandhi applied that also 17 times. Every time he managed to rest the concession. And so he did not have to fast unto death. Yet, during partition, which was about the unity of India, which was about the non-enmity between Muslims and Hindus, of course, which he had often preached about, he refused to use this ultimate weapon. He refused to threaten fasting unto death, probably because China wouldn't have cared, would have let him die. Uh, so there was a bullet needed for him to achieve that. And of course, worst of all for the secularists is that he was, in spite of everything, still a Hindu. You know, a Hindu who swore by Ram Raja. In more recent years, the Shiv Sena, when it was still a staunch Hindu party, um, standing by the heritage of uh, Shivaji, and not very much in favor of the Brahmins. It was a bit of an anti-Brahmin party. Nevertheless, set aside this anti-Brahmin rivalry um, and Baal Thakre, its party president, uh, predicted that future generations would erect statues not for Mahatma Gandhi, but for Naturam Godse. He was very forthright in his rejection of Gandhi. Ambedkar was a great critical Gandhi. Um, though it must be said that Ambedkar was not really representative for the untouchables, of which he was a member. The untouchables were very much on the side of Gandhi. And so uh, when the Congress party, after, after Gandhi's death, uh, held a power position for decades, one of the um, groups in its coalition were precisely what was then called the Harijans, huh? the untouchables, together with the Muslims, together with the Brahmins. Um, but so the untouchables really were not on the side of Ambedkar. Nevertheless, Ambedkar's voice is important. He was a great critic of the Muslim League. Uh, he was a great modernist, so he didn't think highly of Gandhi's spinning wheel and rejection of industrialization and so on. Uh, he thought Gandhi was confused, was traditionalist. Um, and his critique of Gandhi is still fairly moderate. His own followers today, 
the Dalit movement hate him far more than Ambedkar ever did. And so a number of statues of Gandhi have been defaced or torn down by Dalit activists. A very interesting critique of Gandhi is by Ram Swaroop. He had been a Gandhian activist. He um, was the secretary of Gandhi's associate, Madeleine Slade, who wanted to, um, he was to edit her memoirs after Gandhi's death. Um, now, his, uh, the second paper he wrote, the first paper he wrote was a critique of the Quit India movement, led by Gandhi. In 1942, he led the movement against the British the Quit India movement, in which Ram Sarup himself participated. But you see, some years later, he, he looked back on it and he said this was totally misconceived. And so, in fact, this critique of Gandhi himself, this critique of this movement. Um, then his second paper is about the Gandhi murder. And so, very interesting, he um, said that um, a great leader like Mahatma Gandhi, for him it is not fitting to die in his bed. You see, to be assassinated is really fitting for a great and controversial figure. That doesn't mean he supported the assassination. No, he supported Gandhi. But nevertheless, he said, in the larger scheme of things, it's only fitting for a great figure that he dies this way. And then finally, the critique of Sitarangoval. And you see, of, of that, you, you do find some elements in my book because I myself uh, have been very much influenced by Sitarangoval. I owe him a lot of insights in the English situation. He too was a Gandhian activist. And um, the founder of the uh, publishing house, Biblia Impex, and then later Voice of India. So um, he had heard, of course, very many Hindus uh, blame Gandhi for the partition. Now he rejected this. He said, you see, Gandhi made serious mistakes about the partition, about Islam in general, like saying that all religions say the same thing Ishwar Allah Tere Nam. But you see, this, these were not Gandhi's own mistakes. These mistakes were shared with large sections of Hindu society. You see, if Hindus blame Gandhi, they are mistaken. They should blame Hindu society. Hindu society was not ready for this challenge. It had never prepared itself for this challenge. And so it made serious mistakes before this challenge. And Gandhi was one expression of these mistakes, but it's not Gandhi's own fault. He followed suit. And so, yes, you see, a more practical politician perhaps might have followed a more rational uh, policy with much, with many. Uh, it's uh, less casualties. Uh, but on the whole, you see, Hindu society, the Congress movement, had the same disease as Gandhi showed. Like the appeasement of Muslims in order to bring them over into the Congress movement, into the freedom movement. That was not originated by Gandhi. You see, Congress leaders had been following this policy of appeasing Muslims and so on since years before, during the Khilafat movement, for instance, even Swami Shraddhananda, a staunch Hindu, co-founder of the Hindu Mahasabha, preached on the steps of the Jama Masjid in Delhi in favor of the Khilafat movement. So Gandhi's mistakes were Hindu society's mistakes. They were shared with many. They were shared to a large extent with, for example, the present BJP government. It is no wonder that Narendra Modi is full of praise for Mahatma Gandhi, calls himself a Gandhi follower and so on. You see, 
Gandhi was not an ideal to follow. And in fact, in his own mind or in his own public speeches at any rate, he never said so. He didn't call himself the father of the nation. He called himself the son of an ancient Hindu nation, right? And so when you look at ideals among uh, Hindu leaders, you should not act like Jawaharlal Nehru, who with his very blinkered, very narrow vision, thought that India had produced three great political leaders, namely Ashoka, Akbar, and Nehru himself, and two great spiritual leaders, the Buddha and Mahatma Gandhi. No, you see, you should take Hindu society as a whole. And so there are very many spiritual greats in India, all the Vedic Rishis uh, to start with. Um, and there were many important political leaders that you can learn from. There was Chanakya and so on. And so Gandhi is just one of the many, not even the best of the many. And it makes no sense to say, I am a follower of Gandhi. What is this, you know? He himself was a follower. And so Hindu society, Hindu history has much better to offer than Gandhi, who became important through force of circumstances, partly <clears throat> because he was greatly favored by the British. You see, Gandhi at least didn't kill any British people. You see, they were very, uh, very firm in their putting down the Bengal revolutionaries because they were a danger. They were politically not very strong. They would not have achieved independence, but they were a danger to every Britisher personally. And so the British didn't like them. They liked Gandhi because he was nonviolent. And maybe in the distant future, he would achieve something or his movement would, but at least he was no danger to them. So they favored him. They treated him and Nehru and so on with kid gloves. They never bore the brunt of prison life like Savarkar did. They were always spared and kept in comfort and so on. So you see, through force of circumstances, with the sentimental devotion of the Hindu masses also thrown in, he became far larger than he really was. And so if I had wanted to do anything with my book, it is bring him back to his proper proportions. Gandhi was not a giant. Gandhi was an ordinary politician who had some achievements to his credit, who also made very serious mistakes. And so it is because of one of these mistakes that the assassin thought that assassination would be the best means to solve it about that I have my doubts but I think I have explained now more or less uh, my reasons for uh, my nuanced judgment of this uh, history. Thank you. Uh, from your talk I can conclude that Gandhi was not a Mahatma. He was more of a villain than Jinnah himself. So considering this if we wish to rewrite our history or we just uh, want to uh, show the true history that Mahatma Gandhi was not a Mahatma himself. And so considering this, what do you think, what will be the consequences as the Western media also worship Gandhi as a messiah of non-violence and even our present government, like there are so many programs in the name of Mahatma Gandhi, like MG Narega, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, so what's your take on this? Can we rewrite our history and show Mahatma that he, he was not Mahatma? Well, I wouldn't worry about the, uh, the sobriquet Mahatma, you know, whatever he is called. Uh, I wouldn't have called him Mahatma, but now that he's called that, I don't care. I mean, that's not my issue. But um, the opinion of the West in this case is not very important. You see, when 
battling, when denouncing, when blackening Narendra Modi, there the West does have its own agenda, which is more complicated than what Hindus imagine. But there the West has agency. There they care about blackening Modi. When it comes to Mahatma Gandhi, who is by now a distant memory, the West doesn't care. You know, they go by the image that emanates from Indian sources. And that image still is very positive. And Narendra Modi is keeping it positive. You see, all his critics may write that he belongs to the movement responsible for the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. But he himself keeps on glorifying the Mahatma. And so as long as that doesn't change, then the glorification of the Mahatma outside will go on. Um, there, are, there are a few um, cracks in this idealization, but from fairly irrelevant, irrelevant motives, I mean, for the situation in India and the struggle against partition and so on, uh, what he thought or did in South Africa is not really important. Now, of course, the fact that he accepted the then dominant racist paradigm, um, I think that's not good. Though he was a child of his time, we shouldn't be too harsh on him for that. Nevertheless, he was mistaken about that. If you treat him as a pioneer, as a guiding light for mankind, then you can expect better from him than simply to follow the spirit of the times. He should not have been a racist, but he was. Now, you see, that I can understand in the sense that he was a child of his time. Most people in those days were racist. All right. But nevertheless, now with the Black Lives Matter movement, there has been a certain mobilization of against Gandhi, because by now, you know, with the internet, just a few people knowing something may be enough to spread the message everywhere. So by now, everyone knows that in South Africa, he was not pro-black. So from that angle, you get criticism of Gandhi. Also from the feminist angle, he was not a feminist at all. Again, a child of his time and so on. Nevertheless, if you treat him as a role model, then you shouldn't take that excuse. Then you should say, no, no. You see, he should be a guide, you know. We should be able to follow him. Well, we can't follow him. With, with ideals like that, you know, we won't be done with. Or another thing in the West that is always held against him is his letters to Adolf Hitler. Uh, he wrote two letters to Adolf Hitler in 1939, 1940, where he tried to avert or nip in the bud the Second World War. And so in India, both the Hindu nationalists and the communists have always lambasted him for this, saying, you know, oh, how ridiculous you see, how you think you can make peace with, with Hitler. Well, here you see, I dissent from the usual critique of Gandhi. You see, I think on this point, Gandhi was right. If you don't make an effort to stop the biggest act of violence in world history, the Second World War. How can you say you are against violence? If that war was okay, well then for any smaller war, you can also find justifications, right? So if you're against violence, you should do what Gandhi tried to do. And in fact, you see, if you study history backwards, you can see that if you were more in the center of power than Gandhi was at that time, and if you kept your eyes open for chances of making peace, as Gandhi certainly did, then you see it was indeed possible, not entirely to prevent the war, but to stop it in the beginning. You see, in 1940, after Hitler had failed to invade Britain, he sent out some feelers for peace. He wanted, you see, he didn't want enmity with the British. He wanted en enmity with the Soviet Union. That's the second problem. Okay, that remained to be solved. 
but nevertheless, he wanted to make peace with the British. He did not want to invade France, Belgium, Holland, Norway. You see, all that, you know, was up for peace. He was willing to give back the non-German territories that he was occupying. Um, so if, if Churchill, the British leaders at that point had really wanted to make peace, they could have, you see. So it is not as ridiculous as it seems. At any rate, it is quintessentially Gandhian. You see, if you are for Gandhi, then you will support these letters. If you think these letters are ridiculous, then you think Gandhism as a whole is ridiculous. I have two, three questions. Like, uh, if we have uh, today, like, um, uh, someone invade us, like, China, we will be responsible, we will give responsible to Modi only. And that time, Gandhi was one of the great leaders we, uh, we, we, uh, we can portray. Yes. So, we, uh, we will automatically, all the things will go to him only. That mm. means we can say, like, anyone uh, attacks. And what is your stand on Nathuram Kotse? Did he go, did a right thing or it, uh, he was definitely very wrong? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, you see, Hindus have a tendency to, to worship heroes. And this is one of their great weak points. In history, there have been a number of battles of the Hindus against Muslims, where the Hindu army was in a position of winning the battle. Yet they lost because their commander was wounded or killed, or at any rate, not effective. And so then they panicked and they dispersed and they ran away when in fact they were winning the battle. So you see this, this reliance on great leaders is a very important weak point. Now, the the paradoxical consequence is that, of course, if, if, if the army fails, then all the blame is put on the leader. So in a way, you see, this is what happened then. Gandhi was blamed for the whole misery that had, that had come about because he was thought to be the great leader, which is strictly speaking, historically not very accurate. His position in Congress was quite limited. He was propped up as a propaganda piece, but it was not really very powerful anymore. Um, anyway, so the masses saw it like that. So far more responsibility was pinned on Gandhi than, than was actually the case. And uh, so that's why he was murdered. Now, as for Godse's uh, moral caliber, okay, you see, he was brave and sacrificing himself. He knew that he was not going to survive this assassination himself. Um, and that he was angry with Gandhi at that point is quite understandable. Nevertheless, if he had coolly judged the situation, then he might have seen what all the other Hindu activists at the time also felt. Uh, what we with hindsight can certainly see, namely that this would be very counterproductive. You see, after Congress had failed to prevent partition and had allowed a partition far worse than partition should have been, you see, if they had applied Ambedkar's formula for a peaceful exchange of, of population, which the Hindu leader Shyam Prasad Mukherjee supported, but which Gandhi and Nehru blocked, okay? Then there could have been a peaceful exchange of population orderly, you see? Ambedkar had worked everything out, transfer of pension rights and so on. It was all very neat. Okay, you see, they didn't want that. Well, they got partition in, in the form that we had it, with millions of people killed. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that was a terrible thing. Gandhi bore a certain re big responsibility for it. He had not wanted partition, but he had wanted policy. He had insisted on policies that made partition far worse than it should have been. 
Right. So if you say Gandhi deserves a punishment, well, I don't know. If, if, if there is such a thing as punishment in this world, then, then maybe he did deserve a punishment. But if you look at it from the Hindu movement's viewpoint, it was very, very counterproductive. You see, because after partition, the Hindu Mahasabha had the wind in the sails. They were proven right. They had said, you see, Congress will lead you into misery. You see, we'll concede partition and you know, all kinds of misery will follow from it. They had been proven right. If they had been able to continue from where they were then, they had the future for them. And so that did not happen because of the murder. Hindu Mahasabha was out. The next Hindu party that was formed, the John Sang, was already a lot less Hindu. And then in the course of its history, became ever less Hindu. You see, the step towards the, the, the reconstitution of the Jansang as the BJP was already much less Hindu. Uh, and then in the history of the BJP, Hindu elements have been thrown off one after another, like ballast on a sinking ship. Um, so those are the consequences of the murder. You see, the consequences are still with us. If you have BJP secularism instead of BJP Hindu politics, that's a consequence largely of the Mahatma Gandhi murder. And so it was not too difficult to foresee that. You know, you, you, you should not, of course, expect people at that time in any given period of history to know everything that you know today. Okay? But this was not hard to foresee. I mean, that there would be a backlash that Congress was, after all, still in power, that they would impose severe punishment on the Hindu more was, was obvious. So, like, like Godse was still alive and must have heard of the physical retaliation against the Maharashtrian Brahmin community about the death of um, Savarkar's brother, for example. He must have heard about all that. You know, what? I don't know what he went through at that point. You see, there is no record of that. But he must have felt a little bit guilty also. Like, you know, I, I, I eliminated Gandhi for his uh, supposed sins, but I brought all this on, on my own community. You know? So, and those were only the short-term consequences. Long-term consequences were a lot bigger and uh, more important. So, so I think uh, Gotze was, in, in a way, a brave man, an idealistic man, but he was also very thoroughly mistaken. Uh, so, uh, I just want to know uh, whether this uh, the division of the treasure, uh, the, the treasury of newly independent India between India and Pakistan yes. for which uh, Gandhi had fasted. That had yes. any role in pushing Godse over? Yeah, to of course, that, that was the immediate uh, occasion, the immediate reason for passing to the act. He had been thinking of such kind of act, but, you know, he hadn't gotten down to business. And with this fast unto death in favor of more money for Pakistan, uh, he said, well, this is too much. This man has to be punished. This is uh, Jadam. Uh, actually, I logged in from a son's uh, laptop, so his name is Kritivas. My name is Jadam. As a 12-year-old, when I first read the story of uh, Gandhi's life, uh, all the little respect that I had uh, for him blew off when I read through the Brahmacharya experiments and his stubbornness. I came to the conclusion that he was an accident of time and he should have been uh, removed much earlier than what God said did was at a much later time. Had that happened, Bose would have continued as the president of the Congress or Patel would have become the prime minister. I don't know why Patel uh, caved into mm. Gandhi's emotional blackmail. And all this has resulted in the Indian nation after the 
uh, independence being uh, held by nehru and his family in a backward state and let me say first something about the british you see against all this hindu talk that uh, the british were responsible for partition and so on i always defend the british because it's not true that they imposed partition nevertheless nevertheless the british guilt the british um, indebtedness towards india is enormous and so they not only destroyed india's economy but you see in the present context it is they who imposed gandhi and nehru on india um and so that was a <laughs> that was a very bad thing um you see there are many other strands in the freedom movement and in fact they are enumerated by god say in his in his speech uh there were the revolutionaries that you still have heard about then there were the constitutionalists who wanted to go by purely juridical means within the framework of the british empire they were also lambasted by gandhi you see he he didn't allow any any form of agitation except for his own um and so that was an approach that the british could live with they they knew how to like toy with him you see to give him a little but you see to keep him from getting anything serious and so and they felt safe you see as long as he's in he's the leader you see nothing will happen to us uh so uh general bakshi was very right in his book and, and anuj dar uh in his book about bose's life you know were very correct in saying that it is the threat of subhash chandra bose and the military option the 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 uh the threatening disloyalty of the british indian troops towards the british empire that forced the british to decolonize to quit india and nothing that gandhi had done you see gandhi was a man of the past by the 40s in the um city in umas as well as the muslim league <coughs> had fully supported the british during the war uh both for reasons of their own the muslim league simply to serve muslim interests best not because they liked the british so much the hindu mahas about to serve in hindu interests best but they were of course also open to the option of subhas bos who wanted to prepare for independence in a different manner namely by enlisting his force indian force with the enemies of the british right um so that was there now congress at that time had no real clear position you see they wanted to support the british but they didn't really support them because uh they felt you know their ego felt slighted because the british didn't invite them to support the british right the british simply said okay british india will support the war effort. and so they they felt slighted and so they 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 took every possible position in succession or sometimes at the same time they were very confused then in 1942 thinking that the japanese were going to conquer india mahatma gandhi decided on this quick india movement which of course did not earn him the sympathy of the british you see this was at a time when the british were back against the wall when they were defending themselves against japanese advances so they couldn't use any trouble in india and so they put down the movement very firmly and so at that time the field was left to the muslim league who could just uh, prepare their pawns correctly for achieving partition the congress was nowhere and so from that point on riskani was a man of the past You see even if he had had any importance in the past he had an importance in two senses he mobilized the masses for the freedom movement he didn't achieve much for the freedom movement but at least he did manage to enlist the masses that is an achievement you have to give him a totally different achievement is that he managed to enlist 
uh, Hindu society's conscience for the cause of uh, undoing the caste system, or at least undoing untouchability. Let's see. Uh, that also is an achievement that, you know, that's not important for the freedom movement, but that's also there, that you have to recognize. So Gandhi has certain things to his credit, but you see, in terms of achieving freedom, his movement is not, you know, as Clement at least said later after the war, Gandhi's influence on the British decision to quit India was minimal. And so everybody knew this in the mid 40s. So by the time of independence, you see Gandhi was just a, an iconic figure out there, but you know, we, we didn't matter much anymore on the ground. And so he was made immortal. He was made larger than life precisely by being assassinated. You see, he had become an unimportant figure and he would have, you know, withered away silently if he had not been assassinated. 